Uh, scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 verses 24 through 25. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. So, this afternoon, you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 4. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm missing the, the PowerPoint, so the verses aren't going to be up there or anything. But Ezra chapter 4, it's not a book that we normally turn to, so I'll give you a few minutes to get there. Because our, our main lesson actually comes from Haggai, uh, which might throw you off a little bit. But Ezra chapter 4 is where we'll be. As a little bit of background, see the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophet Haggai, he penned a book whose contents span just two chapters. And that's it, just two chapters. But included in these 38 verses are four articles relating to the temple's rebuilding, which Nebuchadnezzar uh, destroyed after capturing Jerusalem in 586 BC, when he also took the Jews over to Babylonian captivity. Uh, so it's four articles, just two chapters relating to the rebuilding of the temple. Because after it was destroyed, years later, Cyrus, uh, he granted the Jews the privilege of rebuilding both the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, and the temple. And at first, they were overjoyed. You know, they had been in captivity, and now they were able to go back and rebuild the, the city of David and the temple, the central place of their worship. But as time passed, each person became increasingly interested in their own work not so much focused on rebuilding the temple. They, they were focused on their own house. And they waned in their desire to see the temple of the Lord completed. Enter Haggai. After 16 years, he enters with Zechariah in an effort to encourage them to go back, to return to their labors of rebuilding the temple. Now, if we look at Paul's letter to those in Rome, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So I know that sometimes when we look at the Old Testament, we say, okay, it's, it's a bunch of prophets, it's a bunch of kings, it's a bunch of this and that. And, you know, some people might say, oh, it's a bunch of hooey because, you know, I, I'm not a Jew. I'm never going to be a Jew, and that's all done away with, so there's just no point in it. But the fact is, is that Paul says that there's a great point in it. For the Jews, it was to help train them in, in how to worship God when the new covenant came in, when, when Christ came. It, and it was to help keep them looking forward to the Messiah that was to come. For us as New Testament Christians, there's still lessons for us to be learned from there. Because those things that Christ clarifies in the New Testament, they started in, in the Old Testament. And much of what he says and what the apostles had to say. So with that in mind, we're going to briefly consider the book of Haggai and learn some of those valuable lessons that God wants to show us. And I realize that I told you Ezra chapter 4, and that's where we're going to start off. Um, the first lesson that I want us to consider that is that difficulty should not delay us. Difficulties should not delay us, and they should be faced with courage. We have to remember we're talking today about building the house of the Lord. And, you know, the Jews, they had to realize that the job they were taking upon themselves was, it was significant. It had only been done really once before. And, and at first, again, we see that they quickly and they courageously enter into this work. And even though they're facing a great deal of hostility from the Samaritans, as recorded in Ezra, that's what we're about to look at. 
Now, if you were to turn to the very front of your Bible and look at the table of contents, you would see that Ezra is about 21 books before Haggai. Uh, that's the way it's laid out. So it kind of throws you off, but, but that's really because the books in your Bible, they're not in chronological order. Uh, and, and realistically, if we were to look at things chronologically, Ezra and Haggai, they're within about 100 years of each other. So you look at your Bible and you say, wow, there's 21 books between them, so there must be a, a great deal of separation. And really, they're only about 100 years apart, the events are. So listen to what Ezra records about those opposing the Jews. In Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, says, Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus the king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius king of Persia. Now, you might wonder why these people had an issue. And, and in fact, there's actually a great lesson in just the preceding verse. Because in the preceding verse, the people of the land, the indigenous people, they said, look, we've been worshiping your God. We've been sacrificing to your God. We're going to help you build the temple. And the Jews, they said, no, you're not. You're not going to have anything to do with helping us build the temple. And part of the reason is because in the years past, now the, this wasn't a, a racial thing with the Jews and the people of the land. It wasn't political. It was purely religious. Because in years past, the Jews, they had, you know, brought in contracts and worked with the people of the land, and it always led them to idolatry. So even though you have a people who say, look, we worship the same God that you do, the Jews kind of know because we've seen the way that you worship him. So you're not going to have anything to do with building the Lord's house. So there's even a great lesson there, but it serves as the backdrop because, because of the Jews' refusal, the people of the land, they tried to discourage them and said, okay, if we can't help, then we're going to do everything we can to stop you from doing it. To the point to where they hired counselors. Now, that would be professional protesters if we were to look at it in modern terms, right? Not people who really have any stake in the agenda, uh, just voices for hire, if you will. You know, we, we want to hire people to go out and protest against you. No doubt, like most or, or many protests, you'll have a few people who take things too far and maybe they were burning some of the materials the Jews were using and, and what have you. And not only that, though, but then the people of the land, they write a letter to King Artaxerxes. And we actually, it's in Aramaic, but it was translated, it says, and we have that letter beginning in verse 12. It, it says, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now, because we receive support from the palace, it's not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. Now, that's kind of interesting. See, it, it goes a lot farther than just we're going to hire some professional loudmouths to, to taunt them and call them names and get in their way and disrupt things. We're going straight to the top. We're skipping local legislative branches. We're going all the way to the king, and, and we're going to write him this letter. And it's basically, look, we've got Jews here who are building this city, this evil city. And it's evil. Why? Well, because in their eyes... It's not paying tribute to an earthly king. It's paying tribute to a heavy, heavenly king. Remember, this is the city of David. Now, we know that the Jews had some issues with the past. We just look at the book of Judges, and it's up and down, up and down. We know that they've got problems. 
We look at the book of Esther and Haman and, and the issues that were going on there. So, but they say, look, if you let this happen, not only will they not pay taxes to you, but they will suck your treasuries dry. They will use up everything that you have built for yourself. You will have no money. And not only that, not only that, but you won't have any dominion either. You will not be able to control these people. They're rebellious people, a seditious people. And they tell the king, they tell Artaxerxes, don't take my word for it. Go look at the history books. Look and see what it said. It's very much akin when, it, when I'm up here or someone else is, is up maybe preaching or teaching. And it's like, look, don't take my word for it just because I'm standing behind a microphone. No, go look at the book. Make sure that it's in there. So after Artaxerxes does that, he orders the people of the land to go up to Jerusalem and stop the Jews. It says there in verse 24, Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now that's some serious opposition. The people, the king, that's some serious opposition, and we face opposition as well. Yeah, even in the modern age, we face opposition, everything from biblical illiteracy to, to liberalism, from complacency to materialistic ideologies and, and idolatry that, that, that here is what's important. Now, surely everyone in this room understands that, that we have a mission today that is very similar to the Jews in that we are to build the house of God. Now, I understand that, that Christ built the, the church. I, I, that's not what I'm saying. Matthew 16, 18, clearly Christ built the church. But it's our responsibility as Christians to help further the borders of the kingdom here on earth with the time that we have. And surely we face opposition. But that's what the commission is is to go out and expand these things. And perhaps we can learn from these people the necessity of facing up to our responsibilities regardless of what we have to face in order to do so. You see, God's message, it results in action. The first thing we want to see is that obstacles, opposition should not delay us and that we should face those struggles with courage. And the second is that God's message, it results in action. Though the people had become disinterested in rebuilding the temple, the message of Haggai, a message from God, changed all that. And another prophet, Isaiah, he would write in chapter 55 and verse 11, So shall my word that be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I mean, the, the word of God, if the pure word of God goes out and it is spoken in truth and it's spoken in love and it's not compromised, it will yield results. It may not yield them to the degree that we want. I tell you, I would love nothing more than to stand here on a Sunday and have 40 people come up say, I need to be baptized right now. I can't put it off. I would love that. I, I sit there and I've got friends over in, in, in various uh, points in Africa and what have you, and I see them post on, online all the time, uh, you know, about how many baptisms uh, they have. We have one gentleman who messages uh, us a couple of times a week, actually. And he's always sending pictures of how many people are responding and being baptized and all of this. So the results that we receive, they might not be to the quantity uh, that we want or to the degree that we desire, but they are, will yield results if we do it in truth and love. The Lord's message brought the Jews to their senses and caused them to again begin their most important work. Yeah, sure, it took a while. It was kings and it was people and it was a lot of pressure that caused them to stop and they started, you know, focusing on themselves. But, 
But Haggai comes in with a message, and it, and it really stirs him up. God is timeless, and so are his words. Today, God's message will still result in action if it's received with honest hearts. Remember, I mean, y'all remember the parable of the sower, right? Or, or maybe some do more than, than others. I'll just read it real quick for those that may not or those who may be watching this online and aren't familiar. But Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. That's the Jews at this point, that they had the word of God. Some temptation, some opposition comes. Devil comes and takes that word away. Now, the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, they go out. They're choked with cares, riches, pleasures of life. They bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. You know, I, I think that at times, every one of us, resembles each of these. I don't think it's really one individual that, that it matches. It, because, you know, there, there could be times when, it, you know, you hear the word of God and it's noble and you have this good heart and you keep it as best as you possibly can. And then life just kind of gets in the way and you struggle and and you wane for a little while and, and maybe skip a service here or skip a class there. And, and so then you're kind of translated from that last soil to one of the others, and then it comes back. And so I, I think really this is kind of the context of, of, a, of a spiritual individual uh, at, at different lev levels, though. You know, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You ever think about, just as a side note here on Hebrews 4, 12, you know, the word of God, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, uh, have you maybe ever, and obviously I'm not asking you to raise your hands or anything, but maybe you just know of someone who's had a bone marrow transplant? You know, that's a painful process. There's no sedation there. It's painful, and you're screaming out. And it's kind of like the Word of God sometimes. When you're convicted in your spirit is that it can be painful sometimes. Because maybe you're confronted with things in your life that, that you didn't want to deal with before. And, and so sometimes it, you have to pull away because that's how the word of God is. It pierces down to the joints and to the very marrow. There's nothing that you can do except work through it if you want it to do its job. You know, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and, and also to the Greek. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the testimony of Christ. So the word of God, the same then to the Jews, the mouth of Haggai and other prophets, it's the same to us, and that we have to keep building the house. We can't allow the opposition to get in our way. We have to face those things with courage, as daunting as it may be, as fearful and as afraid we might be. We have to face those things with courage because that's the only way to build God's house, is with courage, is with strength. It wasn't easy. But I'll tell you, at least we're not living in the times where people are burned at the stake for preaching or being drawn and quartered or any number of punishments. We don't live in those times. We live in a time to where anybody can get online and speak to thousands of people about the gospel. 
we have to consider that before the seed is watered, before God gives the increase, the seed has to be planted. That's why Christians have to teach the gospel, whether in personal studies or otherwise. We need men who are not only willing to study, but to stand. And stand and speak the truth. And I say men talking about the mixed assembly that we're in. But ladies, and I know that you know this, and God bless you for it, you know that doesn't get you off the hook, though. You know that. But we also know that there can be some men who say women have no place, and there can be some women who say I have no place. Christians are all given the commission to work man or woman. It may be at times unpopular. In fact, more people will reject it than accept it, but the truth will ultimately prevail. You know, Richard Wormbrand, uh, he's a, he was a Lutheran priest. He passed away 20 years ago or something. But he was imprisoned and tortured by the communist regime in Romania in uh, World War II, and they had maintained a, a policy of state atheism, very much uh, China. And uh, in his book, uh, Tortured for Christ, which you can actually get for free just Googling and going to their site, uh, he writes, it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached, and they beat us. We were happy preaching, they were happy beating us, and everyone was happy. <coughs> you know, it is kind of, in a way, a, a humorous way that, that he puts it, you know? But you read this tiny little book, you know, about his stay in prison, and... You know, it's interesting to read them being forced to stand for days on end, being put in these, these cages with spikes, and every time they lean, they get, they get poked by an iron nail or, or something. I don't agree with all of his doctrines, but I do agree with his courage. And I, I can only hope and pray and wish and everything else that if those times were here in the United States that I'd be able to do that. I hope. I don't know though, honestly. I think that's all something that we all have to examine as to how we stand in opposition. But if we don't allow the, the difficulties to delay us and, and we face struggle in opposition with courage, God's word will result in action one way or another. For Christians, it will be encouragement and to strengthen. For the non-believer, it will convince and convict. And our materialism should not push God nor his church to the background either. See, the Jews before Haggai came. Let's go ahead and turn over to Haggai chapter 1. I'll give you a few minutes to get there. I know, Haggai chapter 1. I'm not looking to see who's checking the table of contents right now. But... But Haggai chapter 1, the, before Haggai came, the Jews, they had allowed the, the building of their own houses and the attaining of wealth to crowd out the rebuilding of God's house. They allowed what they wanted to take prominence. So I just want to read, beginning in verse 4 of Haggai chapter 1. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. See, the Jews, they were so focused on themselves and what they wanted, what they thought God would be, would be happy with. God didn't interest them anymore, and because of that, we see them punished for their failure. They could not hope to enjoy divine favor when they showed no concern for spiritual matters. 
That's one of the things when it, when it comes to the church. I, I've seen a lot of different, you know, church buildings, houses of worship or what have you that look really, really nice. And yet there's no one in them. I remember a few years ago, oh, more than two or three, uh, the family, when we were looking for a congregation at the time with which to worship and work, uh, we were in Tennessee, just outside of Memphis. And there's a congregation there, nice building. It was built for six, seven hundred people. So large building, and really nice offices and, and all of that. Their attendance was about 40 Sadly, that's the state of a lot of congregations in the United States. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a, a nice building or a big building or anything like that. But if we're focused on building our own house instead of God's own house, then we're just like the Jews. You're building this over here. Everything looks great. But my house is in ruins. You have these, these nice paneled houses and, and all of this stuff, but my house, the beams are rotting. When we're building the church, when we're helping to build based on that chief cornerstone, it's more of a matter of the physical. It's the spiritual. Because it's the spiritual that's going to get the person to heaven, not the physical. We all end up in the same place in the dirt. Doesn't matter how rich you are. Doesn't matter what accomplishments you've had personally. In the end, we're all placed in the ground. You know, it's like Steve Jobs, one of the richest people you know, on the planet at the time, founder of Apple and all of this, his last words, oh my, oh my, oh my. I almost have to wonder, was he saying, oh my, I was wrong? Oh my, I see what's coming? Oh my, I can't believe I have to die too? I thought my money was going to save me? Not a clue. We might ask, where are we on this account? Do, do we expect to enjoy divine favor and not be focused on spiritual matters? Do we think it's a trade-off? From this list, you know, in Haggai 1, 4 through 6, it's rather evident that we have a vast majority of people who, who hope to receive divine favors even though living a life in total disregard to spiritual matters. And when I say we, I'm talking about the whole of humanity. I'm talking about those within Christendom, okay? In our, if our pursuits of materialism crowd out the building of the Lord's house or the worship, then our wealth has already cost us too much. Mark 8, 36 and 37, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What are you willing to give up for your soul? A million dollars? Most Christians would probably say no, not for a million dollars. I wouldn't give up my soul for all the money in the world. Fair enough. Would you give up your soul for the bitterness in your heart against your brother? Would you give up your soul for the anger that you can't put away? The anger toward your neighbor, toward your family or your spouse? Oh, yeah, you might not give it up for a million dollars, but would you give it up for that Netflix movie you know you shouldn't be watching? It's sad and puzzling that that which is most precious to us, that we wouldn't sell for all the, we won't sell it for all the world's wealth, but we'll give it away so cheaply. I don't understand that. I won't sell it to you for a million dollars, but I'll give it to you for a pound of dirt. That's what it equates to. 
Surely we all have to understand the principles set forth by Paul relative to sowing and reaping over in Galatians 6, verses 7 through 8, if you're taking notes. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who slows to, sows to the flesh will reap the flesh, will reap the flesh of corruption. He who sows to the spirit will reap everlasting life. We have to be careful not to allow material consideration to crowd out God or his worship. The concern of material things is not wrong in themselves, but it is when they become the dominant things in our lives and we think that we can buy heaven. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Luke 12, verse 15, he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. 1 John 2, 15 and 17, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. End of statement. You love the world... You don't have the love of God in you. I didn't say it. Technically, even John didn't say it. God said it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is the world. And this world, he says, is passing away, and the lust of it, that'll flee too. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Because of this, we see God beginning to punish them for not honoring him as they ought because when our love for material things overshadows our love for God, it displeases him. Look down at Haggai, verses nine, chapter 1 still, verses 9 through 11. Don't worry, we're going to start to close. I was hoping the clock was still broken. But beginning in verse 9, You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. And then you could go back to verse nine. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because my house is in ruins. You wanted to grow, but you were so focused on yourself that I withheld it back. You want to sit there and you want to say, well, what can I do? What can, what can we do? What, what programs, what events, what, what can we do to help it grow? Meanwhile, God is up there in heaven shaking his head saying, you can't do anything. I withheld it because my house is in ruins. By material things, by the way, we're not just talking about physical objects. I'm sure we, we all know that. It could be an attitude of the flesh and not of the spirit. It may be putting other activities in front of the gospel. Each one of us, each individual person has to examine, test themselves to, to see whether they're in the faith or not. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Each one of us has to look at ourselves in the mirror, not with the noise of the world, not with our spouse going, Chi -chi -chi, you know, or anything else. No, look at ourselves in the mirror, close everybody else off and say, who am I in Christ? I love my wife, but when I die, she's not going to take the witness stand for me. She's not going to be there. We stand and are judged alone. Shut out the noise and examine who you are in the faith. Full obedience to God is a necessary condition of approaching him. For the Jews to receive the blessings that God promised, their lives had to come in tune with God. Like today, total obedience is necessary as a condition to approaching him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Paul wrote Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Luke records in Acts 4 and verse 12, there is salvation nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. 
There is no one else. But the Jews didn't realize that. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Too many want a half step in their walk with God. They're not fully committed. Sure, at first things are going well, just like the Jews. They started off building the temple. Everything's great. But then things start to get in the way. Just like the Jews, over time, they, people become in, disinterested in godly things. They, they slowly stop coming to classes. Right? And then they're never seen at the evening services or, or the midweek Bible studies. And then finally, Sunday mornings are gone. Y'all know, we all know what we call people who show up every service, especially the Wednesday, the midweek service, if it's available, the faithful few. What's that indicate? That if you're not there, you're unfaithful. I mean, in our minds, that's, that's what we're saying. And most of the time, people leave the church for one of two reasons, and then we're going to close. The first is that there's some disagreement with the brother or sister, and they didn't handle it biblically, meaning that they did not go to them and try to fix it out. You know, scriptures tell us hey, if you come and offer your gift and realize that you have something against your brother, leave your gift, first be reconciled, then come back and offer it. Be reconciled. They're more content to be miserable and spread a lot of rumors, a lot of negative attitudes with them to such a degree that no one wants to be around them. And we all know those types of people. I don't even want to be around this person just because every time they open their mouth, it's just bad talking to someone else. That's the first reason. The second reason that people leave the church is because there's no one that's feeding them. We all sit at the same table, but not everybody's eating. Unless a person is fed the meat of the gospel, they will not grow. Unless someone can connect with the message of the cross, they will not succeed. And if a congregation is not interested in spiritual growth, then there's no point in that congregation. Yeah, I said it. If the congregation is not interested in growing in a deeper knowledge of God, and a deeper knowledge of God's word, then they're a social club. I'm not saying that about here. Just as a general principle. Because the reason that we come together is for God. Granted, we get the benefits of it, too, being able to, to socialize and fellowship together. But ultimately, we come to praise God. And if we're to grow spiritually, we have to focus on building the house of the Lord first. Our wants, they need to take a back seat. You know, there was a bumper sticker that said, uh, if Jesus is your co-pilot, you need to change seats. That's pretty accurate. Jesus doesn't need to be the co-pilot. He needs to be the one in charge. Are you ready? You have to ask yourself, are you ready to face obstacles head on? Because God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This year, just a couple of months in, it's already been challenging. We've still got the pandemic going on. Granted, it seems to be easing up. And then it gets so cold in Texas, people completely forgot they were staying in because of the pandemic. And they were staying in because it's eight inches of snow in the driveway. You almost go outside, and people are like, woo, the sun's out. Oh, that's right, I could die. You know, put the mask on. There's challenges. But we can all do something to help grow God's church. If there is anything at all this afternoon that we can help with, you want to talk, you need the prayers of the congregation, it doesn't have to be me. Talk to anybody here, but talk to somebody if you need to. But we will do everything that we possibly can to, to make things right and, and to help you in your, your Christian walk. But praying for you, I hope that things are well and they, they get better for you. Let us know if you need anything. Just come on forward as together we stand and sing our praises.